you're dealing uh, with EXF3 versus EXF4, uh, EXT3, EXT4, uh, or HPFF. There are so many file systems out there. Uh, we'll talk about some of them as we get a little bit deeper into this section. One area that's very important to keep in mind is cluster size. Cluster size really affects the performance of the disk and also it can be changed. You can alter it if you want to optimize your disk performance and when you format the disk you'll have a choice of cluster size in uh, many different disk formats. And so the size of the cluster really depends on the size of the partition of the disk and the type of file system that's installed. Is it FAT? Is it XFAT? Is it EXT4? Uh, is it uh, NTFS? I'll, we'll look at these as we get a little bit deeper into the class. Uh, a large cluster size, which is greater than one sector. So if you have a large cluster size, uh, it has these effects. Number one, it minimizes fragmentation problems. It increases the probability of unused space, which means that you may have a one terabyte drive, uh, but you're only going to have uh, some hundreds of gigabytes of uh, usable space. Right? Also, it reduces the disk storage area in which information can be saved. So again, like I was saying, you're losing storage area and reduces the unused uh, area on the disk. All right, so that there are, there are consequences to cluster size. Very important to know that logical uh, designation. The next thing we talk about is lost clusters. Lost clusters, where are they? Where do they go? What does it mean? And if you uh, look at the disk, uh, if, you, if you look in, let's just zoom in on this, you see that we're doing a check disk. Uh, with a check disk, you can use this for very many different tasks. And one of those is to have a look at what is going on with that file system. And one of the items that you'll find uh, potentially is the number of lost clusters. Uh, we see bad sectors, lost clusters, and so what is a lost cluster? So your operating system, what it's going to do is going to say, hey, these are all the clusters over which I have control. Uh, and if, it use, if it, it'll mark a cluster as used, but doesn't allocate them to any file, then they're lost. So a lost cluster is uh, a fat file system error that results from the manner in which the FAT file system allocates space and chains files together. And because of that, you can have lost clusters when you do a check disk. So it's mainly the result of the logical structure error and not a physical disk error. In other words, it's because of the file system uh, that you formatted that disk. In this case, the file allocation table or FAT file system. And they usually occur because of interrupted activities. So uh, let's say that you're in a hurry and you shut down and the file wasn't closed properly. And so uh, they, the cluster never had a pointer, a link uh, to the file in which it was being used or with which it was being used. So it's a lost cluster. So going back to check disk, uh, this is a nice little built-in system tool in Windows that will authenticate the file system reliability of the volume and it will also do its best to repair logical file system errors. So if you have trouble with, it's not going to repair physical errors, uh, but it will help with those logical errors and it might help to uh, put that file system back together. So uh, those are what we deal with lost clusters. The next thing we're going to talk about is Slack space. What in the world is Slack space? Well, it's a storage space on the storage area of a disk between the end of a file um, and the end of a cluster. All right. So um, here's a file, user file.txt. This file continues into the next sector. 
but it only takes up uh, this much space, the, the, where we see that file, that, that color. This, this line right here is the end of the file. However, it ends in the middle of a sector, and I can't write anything else until I finish out the entire cluster. So I have a cluster size um, that has a huge amount of slack space because I had a really small file. So if let's say that I were to have uh, how many bytes of this file? Uh, I didn't say first 5, 12 bytes. So uh, this is going to be about an 800 byte file or so. Uh, so if I have an 800 byte file, and let's say I have 10,000 800 byte files, most of the storage of that file will be slack space. So if the file size is less than the cluster size, a full cluster is still allocated to the storage of that file. So the remaining unused space is slack space. So here's an example. The partition is four gigs. Uh, each cluster is 32K in size. Even if a file required only 10K, the entire 32K would be allocated to that file, resulting in 22K of slack space. So that can be a lot of wasted space uh, in a disk. And uh, it's something that's very good to know about because in this slack space, it's not empty. This slack space is not empty. If, let's say, I formatted my drive. When I format my drive, all of the data on the drive is still there. What I did is I went to the grid partition table, the file allocation table, I went to whatever it is, and I said, uh, all of the files no longer have links. So let me, let me just take you to a library. Have you been to a library before? Uh, you might be too young to remember libraries, uh, but in a library, uh, one of the features of a library is the card catalog. All right, so if you imagine the library being an, uh, all of the files in a disk drive, and here's how you format it. You pull out each one of those drawers of the card catalog and you just dump out the card catalog. Dump it all out, right? And put in blank cards. And then you, and, and it's done. You formatted the drive. So if you look around the library, you're like, well, there's still uh, 100,000 books in this library. But you go to the card catalog and it's empty. So the drive considers that formatted. So now, and this is where forensic investigation comes in, I add a file to that disk. The file is only this big. What is in the slack space? All the old data from the formatted disk. So if you're doing a forensic investigation and somebody formats their drive, which we're gonna talk about a case where that happened, um, and they've written other files over it, you can still go into the slack space and find the old information in many cases. So that's why we bring that up. That's why we talk about slack space. All right, so let's talk about the master boot record. The master boot record is the first sector. And remember, when we're talking about hardware, we normally start counting from zero not one. So sector zero of a storage device like a hard drive or a flash drive. Well, I guess you don't need that on a flash drive, but it starts with sector zero. The information about the files on the disk and really their locations is very, very important for the MBR and the sizes and other data is stored in that MBR. And it's always a 512 byte boot sector. Uh, on a disk. Now, hard disk can be partitioned, so we might see a partition sector also, which we'll talk about in just a, a little while here. So MBR, it holds the partition table, which shows uh, and maps all the partitions of the disk. And when you uh, boot an OS, bootstrap is, you know, a lot of us uh, have never heard the actual full word uh, for booting an OS, but bootstrap is really where it comes from. So you boot an operating system, you boot Linux, you boot Windows, uh, whatever you boot, uh, the MBR is there 
uh, if you uh, have your disc formatted and have the operating system on that disc and uh, also that MBR is going to recognize all the media with that 32-bit disk signature. So that MBR is there to uh, get your system, your operating system started. If you look at the structure of an MBR, uh, it's got a very uh, interesting structure. It's, it's been around for so long though. Uh, we, we call it bootstrap, the, the master boot code, normally we call it the, the bootstrap, uh, is a little bit of uh, ex, a, a code that can be executed that is responsible for loading the OS into computer memory. So it kicks off the process that starts the loading of the operating system. And uh, if you look over here, let's just look at some of the, the address table description and bytes. So you start here, uh, hex, and that's octal, and that's decimal. So uh, all these numbers are actually the same. They're just in different numbering system. That's base 16, base eight. And the one we have, because we have 10 fingers and toes, good old base 10. Uh, and then we have the size in bytes. So the code area is 440 bytes and the disk signature, four bytes. The, uh, the, the nulls, this is like a gap between the signature and the uh, table of primary partitions. Uh, that's only two bytes. And then uh, here at 446 uh, decimal or 01BE uh, in hex, we have the table of primary partitions. It was a four 16 byte entries uh, for an IBM partition table scheme, uh, which you'll find in PCs, and that's 64 bytes uh, in nature. And then after that, you start with your MBR signature, and uh, with, which is a total of a very lean 512 bytes. So that partition table, uh, as we see right here, that pri a table of primary partitions, uh, 64 bytes in size, it maintains data on the hard disk partitions, so very lean, and then the signature itself at the end of the MBR, uh, it is needed uh, not uh, by the BIOS. Uh, BIOS is a basic input-output system. We'll be talking about that in a little while and how it's used, but it's extremely important in directing the boot of the operating system. So we see it's a very lean structure. Uh, we'll see some other uh, structures that are, are like it for larger drives. Um, MBR is really used for smaller drives, it's older. And now let's talk about partitions. Uh, disk partitions, uh, they create logical divisions of a hard drive. So even an SSD can be partitioned and uh, when we say logical divisions, so uh, when I have a, a hard drive, a hard disk, so let's call it disk zero, I can divide it up into partitions and have those logically uh, drive uh, D, drive E, drive F, et cetera, on the same physical disk. And so uh, if you have an SSD or if you have uh, HHD hard drive, it's the same, so there is always a primary partition. Holds all the information, uh, helps, uh, has the OS uh, system files, et cetera. And when you're dealing with a good old Microsoft DOS, that MS-DOS and earlier versions of Windows, uh, that drive C was always that primary partition. Uh, in other operating systems, in other versions of Microsoft operating systems, uh, that became a lot more variable. The extended partition is logical, meaning that it's not tied to the physical disk and uh, it holds information, uh, data files, etc. And again, that could be like a logical E or F or G uh, drive on the same physical disk divided into partitions. Let's talk about the BIOS. Uh, the BIOS is extremely important and there is a part of the disk that is reserved for helping work with that BIOS and this is called the BIOS parameter block or the BPB, you know, go figure, BPB, a BIOS parameter block. And so it's a data structure uh, in the uh, partition boot sector and it describes the physical layout 
of the storage volume. And this is something the BIOS needs to know, so that's why we have this. A number of heads, the sizes of the tracks. Remember, we're talking about how the track size is variable depending on manufacturer, etc. on that drive. And if you have FAT12, this is, that's file allocation system 12, that's a long time ago. That was way back in the DOS days. FAT16, FAT32, uh, HPFS, which we don't see used very much anymore, the high performance file system. Uh, and NTFS, which we see used quite a lot. The new technology, new back in 1991 or two or so, uh, and upgraded since then, uh, file system. And so this, the BPB defines that file system structure and the length varies depending on if you're running uh, whatever version of FAT or NTFS. Uh, so uh, that length of varies for those, the boot sectors, because we have different types of fields, different types of data stored depending on the different type of format that you format that uh, disk. And so uh, what the BPB does is it, as a forensic investigator, you can locate the file table on the hard drive. And if you can locate the file table, then you can find uh, the files on the hard drive. So uh, this is a, a format for a full DOS 7.1. It's been a long time since I've worked with DOS 7.1, but extended BIOS partition uh, block for, uh, uh, this is for, uh, also works for FAT32. And this is the one for NTFS. Let's zoom in on the BPB for NTFS. So we see there's a, an offset. And for those of you who haven't had a lot of chance to work with uh, uh, different numbering systems, uh, on the far left side under the sector offset, uh, you see that 0x. The 0x means that the following number, so whatever you see after this, is uh, hexadecimal. So if I see the, the, uh, the number zero, uh, and I see another number, zero X, zero, then I know that the zero and the, uh, that follows the zero X is actually a uh, part of the hexadecimal numbering system. So it just names the numbering system. Uh, and then the next field, which is the field length, gives us the, uh, the length of that by uh, length. So we have 25 bytes. We have uh, byte lengths, and we have keyword and dword lengths. And then we have on the description side, we have the physical and flags and extended boot signature and a reserved section and uh, sectors. And the first cluster is down there at 0x30, turned with the sector offset uh, and 0x25 instead of the in terms of the BPB offset. It's a keyword and it's the first cluster number of the master file table. This is actually important because this is where we can begin to look for certain types of data. Uh, and then we go all the way down to the serial number down at the bottom. So uh, this is just the uh, BPB for NTFS that you uh, might be likely to see for an NTFS formatted uh, disk. And on the other side, we have the one that you'll be likely to see for a FAT32 formatted uh, device. All right, so if you have a disk that is more than two terabytes, uh, you will not be able to use the master file table, or M you have to use the GUID, the Global Globally Unique Identifier. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the GPT, or the GUID partition table. So if you have more than two terabytes, you can't use the master file table. You have to use GPT, the GUID partition table. So in order to understand the GUID partition table, the first thing we need to know is what is a GUID or a GUID or a globally unique identifier. What in the world is it? Well, it needs to be globally unique. And so uh, it is referenced by a 128-bit unique reference number. That's a huge number allowing uh, for quite a large number of of identifiers. So uh, as being a nice unique number, uh, they're displayed as 32 hexadecimal digits. Uh, let's go ahead and zoom in on that one and have a look at a GUID. So you'll see that we have curly braces on either side and that GUID is in between those curly braces and it represents a 128-bit 
which is some uh, tens of undecillions of potential numbers. So it helps to keep it as unique as possible. And so in the Windows registry, so if you go into the Windows operating system, those GUIDs, as you see right over here in the registry editor, are used to identify COM uh, DLLs. COM is the common object model, and DLLs are dynamic link libraries. Uh, both of these are used by developers for multiple purposes, which we uh, don't have the uh, capability to go into right now. But either way, in uh, database tables, GUIDs are used as primary key values. Now, we also introduce another concept here of database tables that you would see in an RDBMS or a relational database management system. And, um, but these are lower level tables uh, that are used, the GUIDs are primary keys. In some instances, a website might assign a GUID to a user's browser uh, to help track that session. And that GUID you might find in uh, a cookie, for instance, a secure cookie or something like that. Uh, Windows assigns a GUID, a globally unique ID, to a username to identify user accounts. So in a Windows uh, Active Directory system, you'll see that there is a GUID to uniquely identify the account. Uh, and then there are SIDs uh, also, um, which are security IDs that uh, also help identify what type of account it, it, it is in activities, et cetera. That's all dealing with Active Directory. But GUIDs are used in quite a lot of situations, as you can see, for the common uses of a GUID, a globally unique identifier. And one of the most important uses of a GUID, since we're talking about hard disks, uh, is the GPT or the GUID partition table. And so when you're using UFI, there's another acronym for you. After a while, you're going to have a lot of acronyms in your mind here. So UFI, EUFI, the United Extensible Firmware Interface. Uh, legacy, if you boot, boot an old system, uh, it comes up with BIOS firmware. Uh, one of the ways that you can generally tell that you're running UFI instead of BIOS is UFI normally looks GUI. There's another acronym. Uh, it looks like a graphical user interface, almost like Windows uh, or the, a, a, a graphical user interface running on top of Linux. Uh, whereas BIOS normally looks like uh, a DOS, you know, it has uh, lines and, and letters rather than a nice uh, graphical interface. So UFI is a specification, it's a software interface between the OS and the platform firmware. So in fact, let's kind of just zoom in on this a little bit. We'll look at this a little bit further in the uh, following modules here, but the BIOS is the first thing that starts when you hit that uh, button. And in fact, another thing we'll talk about is the power on self test that happens at the BIOS directs to begin the boot process, because we're gonna be looking at the boot process in just a little while. Both the BIOS and UFI will start that boot process with that power on self test. Uh, but the UFI actually has more capabilities by far than BIOS. Uh, it has replaced the old school BIOS uh, as that uh, interface between hardware and your operating system or other software. And it uses GPT, the GUID partition table. So as the BIOS is a legacy firmware, the MBR is legacy. And some of the advantages of using GPT is that it supports 128 partitions, uses 64-bit LBAs, logical block addresses, supports a maximum partition size ranging from two terabytes to eight zettabytes. And you'll notice that there's a different representation uh, instead of terabytes and zettabytes, uh, we have tebibytes and zebibytes. And the reason why we're going zebi and tebi and uh, gibi instead of uh, zeta and tera and giga is because uh, the tebibytes and zebi, the, uh, that little bi in, instead of uh, era, tera or whatever, um, represents the actual size a lot more accurately 
Um, and it's based upon a, a numbering system that helps with that uh, than uh, Terra or Zeta bytes. But uh, that's why I originally said terabytes and Z zettabytes, because most people understand that uh, terminology a lot more than tebibytes and zebibytes. But what we're saying is if I have a two terabyte drive, two terabyte disk, uh, up to an eight uh, zettabyte disk, by the way, I have not been able to find any eight zettabyte disk drives in Walmart. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, actually, we, actually uh, if you look online right now, probably the largest disk drives that you'll find for sale, they're rotational drives, uh, and they're going to be around 20 terabytes. Those are going to be the largest disk drives. So there's, we're no way near uh, eight zettabytes or zebibytes uh, for disk drives. So we have a lot of extra space to go before we use up the capabilities of the GPT, the GUID partition table. All right, it provides primary and backup partition tables for redundancy. Let's just have a little zoom in on the table scheme for the GUID partition table. So we have, uh, we're talking about those LBAs from a zero all the way down. Let's go all the way down here to uh, 34, 35. And then we, uh, for the 5 through 128, we have LBA 2 and 1, et cetera, because we're heading into the secondary GPT header. Remember we said there's a backup, right? So there's the, G, the primary header, entries, uh, the partitions, and so on that make up a GPT. So uh, very nice to have that redundancy in GPT making uh, the drives more resilient, the disks more resilient. So that's GPT. All right, now let's have a look at understanding the boot process for various operating systems. So as a forensic investigator, um, as a computer defender, as an ethical hacker, uh, all of these require you to understand some of the basic fundamental functionalities of operating systems. And you can troubleshoot. Remember, we we're talking about having the troubleshooting skills being one of the most important items here. If you know how an OS boots, then you can go back through and troubleshoot what exactly happened. So an attacker came in uh, and they modified, what did they modify? Well, this drive has an MBR or this modify has, uh, this drive has a GPT uh, and maybe they modified the disk at a low level uh, or maybe there was malware loaded in uh, or whatever and it disrupted the boot process. But where, where was the boot process disrupted? So you can move your way through all the levels of the boot process depending on the operating system, and that might help you to find out what actually happened, what the attacker actually did, and when. And if you can do that, you might be able to correlate it with other actions that will allow you to solve the riddle of what actually happened with this computer system. So knowing the boot process is very important for forensic investigation. And I'll also say that just for general troubleshooting, uh, knowing the boot process is very important. So when we boot, uh, that is starting the OS uh, from either cold or warm booting. We'll talk about that in a second. Where we take that operating system that's stored in the hard drive or in your SSD or wherever it is into working memory. Everything that you see on your computer right now if you look at your browser, look at all the apps that you have the potential of running, when you run that app or your operating system as it's running right now, which you couldn't uh, be uh, working on this video if your operating system wasn't running, that is all in RAM, actively uh, moderated and uh, managed through your CPU and other processes, but it's in working memory uh, right now. So two types of booting, one is a cold boot. So if you start a computer that's been completely powered down, it is off. Uh, there is no thermal, uh, I mean, if you were to thermally image the computer, you could not see any uh, thermal dissipation from it because it is completely turned off. It's cold. Um, and you hit that on button and then uh, all of the electricity courses through that motherboard and your 
uh, your uh, initial startup processes kick off and start booting that system. A warm boot is when you have a computer that is on. It's on already. And uh, if you were to take a thermal image of that computer system, you would see heat dissipation from the power supply, heat dissipation a little bit from the CPU and several other components that are storing energy. And uh, what happens is uh, in some cases in a warm boot, you already have the operating system in its current state, or previous state, excuse me, stored and ready to run. A warm boot might occur when the system encounters a program error or uh, requires a restart to make certain changes. And so in this case, let's say, uh, um, let's say that you are in the middle of working on an Excel spreadsheet and you get a, a this is the eighth pop-up that you got saying, uh, Microsoft needs to reboot your system. And your system needs to reboot uh, within the next whatever few minutes or it, it, is, it is urgent now. You need to reboot your system to apply the changes for the Microsoft update. And so not wanting it to happen in the middle of your work, you close your spreadsheet, you click on the, the little pop-up link from, from the warning and you tell it to reboot. And so in this case, like I said, thermal imaging would show that your hard disk is still running, that there is... Uh, heat dissipation from your motherboard, your, your system is still warm, and then it reboots. It doesn't go all the way back through to the cold boot process. It just uh, reboots. Sometimes uh, in the industry, we call that bouncing, bouncing a system, right? So uh, you just reboot it, it comes back up, it's like a bounce, right? So that's a warm boot. System is fired up, and you tell the operating system to go ahead and boot it. All right, let's look at some essential Windows files in the boot process. Uh, the first one, and this is extremely, these are all important. I mean, if you have one of them missing or corrupted, you're gonna have a lot of trouble booting. And all of these uh, files at the kernel level are extremely protected. Uh, and on modern Windows operating systems, uh, they also are uh, kept track of to make sure not one zero or one has changed in either file. And these are also files that attackers, uh, at least some of them, like to corrupt uh, using malware. So the first one is NTOS kernel, which is the executive and the kernel. This is the core of the operating system. Uh, from there we go to NT kern pa. Kern pa, what is pa? That pa is the first two letters of PAE, which is physical address extension. And so this is the executive kernel with support for uh, physical ad address extension. All right, next we have the HEL. Uh, HEL stands for Hardware Abstraction Layer, and this is the DLL that's responsible for creating a method for allowing the operating system to discover and make use of all the hardware on your computer system and then allow access in the operating system to uh, use and manages the use of that hardware. Uh, we have Win32K, which is the kernel mode part of the Win32 subsystem. We have NTDLL, this dynamic link library, supports functions, uh, system services, uh, has these uh, little stubs uh, that help with dispatch of these executive functions. And then we have the Win32 subsystem DLL files, which include uh, kernel 32 DLL, uh, uh, AD VAPI, 32 DLL, user 32 DLL, and GDI 32 DLL. So if you see any of these files, these are core system files for Windows systems. So how does it work? Uh, you have an MBR, master boot record. So you have a disk that is smaller than two terabytes. You are running a Windows operating system. So this XP Vista 7, uh, and you can do this with 10 also because you can run uh, depending on the version of 10, actually, MBR uh, boots. So uh, this is, uh, if you're running with Windows 8 and above, they can use traditional MBR, uh, but a lot of them, especially if you were to go buy a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 system right now, it would be using the UFI GPT, not the BIOS MBR, right? So you have to ha have a look at the operating system. If, if you have a computer system that has a four terabyte, eight terabyte uh, disk, 
uh, and all of that disk is being used for one drive. If like a C drive, then you're going to be on the UFI GPT, which we'll talk about in a little while. But if you have a two terabyte uh, disk or a two terabyte drive that's being used for your boot, you could actually be on the BIOS MBR. So let's look and see how it works. Number one, we have the BIOS. And what happens is the basic input output system. What it does is it loads up uh, first of all, when you hit that power button from a cold boot, the BIOS looks around and says, do I have hardware? Is my hardware running? Where is uh, the drive controller? Uh, drive controller zero. Uh, from drive controller zero, where is disk zero? All right, from disk zero, let's find the MBR. Oh, there it is. And I found the location of the MBR of disk zero. All right, good. Well, now that I've found the MBR, uh, let's see if I can find the VBR, the volume boot sector. Very good. All right, so let me hand that over to the operating system. And now the operating system is in charge because wh whatever it's uh, stored and, and it's going to now be referred to uh, and that's going to be that nice NT boot sector that is found wherever it is on whatever uh, drive partition. So the NT boot sector loads and it's going to load a boot manager and that boot manager uh, which is going to uh, know information about uh, the configuration of that system. And that would be uh, information derived from the BCD. This is boot configuration data. And so what this says, the BCD uh, is going to give us information about um, what sector partition, uh, et cetera, and which operating system to load first. Uh, you can have a multi-boot or some other type of situation uh, and the BCD would store that information. And then we also have winresume.exe in case there were other processes that were loaded into memory the last time Windows rebooted. So uh, bootmgr.exe is going to consult with these. Mainly it's going to be looking at that BCD on a, on a regular cold boot, handing that information over uh, to Winload, and Winload is going to start the process of loading the operating system. How does that look to you, uh, a user or an investigator? So I go over to a cold system, I hit the button, and then there might be a vendor splash. Like for instance, if it's an HP system or a Dell system, you might see that. This is where we're all the way going up to here. Uh, and then once the BCD identifies the location of the operating system, then WinLoad loads NTOS kernel, and then we switch, switch over from the uh, BIOS UFI to the OS. And that's when you, uh, you see a Windows splash screen load around that time. Okay, there are several things that are happening here. Uh, but one of these is going to load that splash screen. Uh, NTOS kernel is going to consult uh, with the HEL, the hardware abstraction layer, to make sure that it has access to hardware in the physical computer system. And then the OS, NTOS kernel enters several phases. We're going to zoom in on those a little bit. This is phase zero. Uh, where we have the uh, hell initialization for the BIOS and the kernel initialization. Uh, and then phase one, where we have the uh, uh, hell init system and obby init system, where uh, objects that are important to Windows are loaded up onto the system. Uh, and then we have our SMS uh, and Win32K sys that are uh, consulted. And then we have our Win logon. And that when the Win logon and LSAS uh, happen, that's when you can actually log into the operating system. All right, so let's zoom in on this a little bit and have a look here. So uh, one of the first things you want to do is uh, be able to go into a system and identify partitions. How do you identify MBR? Well, the first thing you want to do, you can do this on your computer system right now. Uh, you can hit a uh, your Windows key and type in uh, MA, uh, uh, M-A, man,
man, M-A-N-G, this first part of manager. And once you type that, uh, you should see a link that goes to computer management. So uh, you just uh, type in those first few letters of the word management, uh, or you can go from many different locations to find. I, like, I just like searching from the Windows button. Uh, and then once, I, once you find that, you'll find system management. With system management, you can click on disk management and you'll get disk management. And on disk management, you take any of the partitions you find, you can right click on it and go to properties. And when you right click on it and go to properties, you'll find the, the volume information and you can see that's MBR right here. So you can get some of that low level information by right clicking on a, on a volume um, in disk management. Uh, and that would be the MBR. So in the Windows boot process, uh, we see that there's an MBR boot process. There's also a UFI GPT boot process. So let's say I have a, I, I was just shopping online and putting together what would be a really cool laptop. And I found one that I could have 64 gigs of RAM and, a, uh, and 16 gigs of SSD uh, wow, that's a, that's really cool. But obviously, if I have a 16 gig C drive on my system, uh, that 16 gig disk is not going to be able to run with MBR. It's going to need uh, UFI GPT. Um, and so what is the process that we use for that? Well, number one, the CPU is going to be in protected mode. And there's a break right here where remember how I was telling you in the MBR boot process where it's handed over to the operating system, same thing over here. So uh, here we go, uh, we start with, we have our low level hardware that uh, we uh, access uh, and test uh, in the power on boot process uh, by initializing the firmware. So the firmware is, uh, a, the word firmware is a cross between hardware and software and it is actually software that's running on a chip. And we get the same thing in BIOS and UFI. Yeah, they're both considered firmware. Gets initialized, that firmware gets initialized. And then the low level hardware uh, is going to be initialized and tested, making sure it's, uh, it's going. And then we have the uh, EFI drivers. Now we're actually running uh, the UFI services because the uh, boot, uh, recognizes the fact that it has uh, good enough hardware to actually proceed with the with the boot through the SEC and PEI, and then we get to DXE, uh, and then from there we see the uh, UFI service, uh, the GPT or MBR in this case is going to be GPT is recognized. We find that first boot sector. All right, found sector zero. Nice, we're good to go. And sure enough, uh, there's information there. And so I can do an early OS kernel initialization and then hand it over to the operating system, and in this, this case, Windows, and then uh, all the user mode processes um, where they're not protected at ring zero. Now we go to a higher uh, level uh, user mode process. So, so that is the UFI GPT. Uh, in some cases, it uh, can be looked at as much more simple but when you actually look at the low level processes that are happening and the protections that you are afforded uh, from hacking and faults and so on, it, it's actually at a low level, a lot more complicated. So if you want to identify the GUID partition table on one of your systems, uh, this is what you can do. In fact, you can do this right now. If you're running a Windows system, what you can do is right click on the bottom right hand, left hand corner where you have your little windows icon on the taskbar, right click on that, and then go to uh, launch PowerShell, uh, PowerShell with ad admin permissions, and then it'll dim your screen uh, and ask you to do yes or no to run it, tell it yes. And then from there, uh, you can do a, a get-gpt. So. What that'll do is, let me just show you uh, a specific get GPT command. Uh, this is a get dash GPT, and then we have a dash path parameter, and then um, this is a double, double WAC, dot WAC, physical, device, physical drive one, right? So uh, this will give you the GPT information. If there is no GPT, uh, it might be MBR, and you'll get this. 
And one of the things uh, in terms of PowerShell, uh, whenever there's an error in red that pops up, what you might want to do is read it. Uh, I've uh, worked with uh, students and uh, customers that use PowerShell, and usually when they get this red text, they just uh, decide, oh man, uh, that's an error, I better try something else, uh, without even reading it. If you see here, the error information is informative. It says, a no GPT found, please use get-mbr. Oh, that's what it's all about. I have a master boot record drive, an MBR, not GPT, and so it's telling me the command I can use. Another one I wanna tell you about uh, irrespective of what you do with this command, the uh, commandlet in PowerShell, if it begins with a get, just parses information. So if you type in the wrong thing and you get an error or it messes up, it's not gonna hurt anything. If you were to use set in the beginning of a commandlet, then that would change things. So you wanna be careful with that. But a get command, unless you pipe the output to a set commandlet, is not gonna be very uh, very damaging. So don't worry about using that on, even on your own computer system. So what a uh, get-gpt does is it parses. The word parse means to, uh, uh, to uh, check into uh, or to um, send in a probe to retrieve the actual data set. So let's just say parse means to send in a probe to retrieve the actual data set. When you parse something, it is an active query into the data or the metadata uh, or the information associated with that, right? So uh, if I parse the, uh, the drive system or I parse the directory structure or I parse the user name list, I'm actually sending in a little probe saying, hey, I need this send me back the actual information. So um, uh, this is a term that's often used in technical circles. I just wanted to make sure that it's understandable. So it parses, meaning it sends in a little probe and says, what is my GPT data structure? And we uh, that's contained in that first few sectors of the drive. And so you have to use the path parameter, that's that dash path, which will take that Win32 device name. And you know what, Win32, even though you're on Windows 11 or Windows 10, uh, and here in you know 2022 or uh, 2023, uh, some of you watching this course, uh, it's still Win32. It should at least be Win64. Uh, one, one of the uh, very interesting items that we find with Microsoft operating systems is they have a huge amount of backward compatibility with older operating systems so that they can interoperate and so on, and I anticipate eventually Microsoft is going to uh, completely redo their kernel, uh, but for now, yeah, Win32, That's that 32 stands for 32-bit Windows back when it was a really exciting thing when Windows went from 16-bit to 32-bit. That was a long time ago, but we still have a lot of those monikers. If you look in your uh, Windows folder, uh, probably the most important folder in your Windows folder is the Win32 system, System32 folder, right? Even though you have a 64-bit system. So just a little uh, uh, throwback time there, throwback time for Thursday. Uh, so um, anyway, you have to give it the namespace. And this is double whack dot whack. Oh, and, and also, just one more thing here. Instead of saying backslash, you heard me use the term whack. Uh, and this is just a common way that Windows system engineers uh, refer to the backslash. Why do we say backslash, I mean whack instead of backslash? Because it's faster. Why? That's why we say dot instead of period. That's why we say star instead of asterisk. That's why we say bang instead of exclamation point. Wasn't bang faster? Oh yeah, so you wanna get these uh, out faster so we, slash is nice and monosyllabic, it's only one syllable, but whack is uh, also monosyllabic, so we don't have to change the slash, but we're changing the backslash because we don't wanna say backslash, we say whack. So you'll hear that, hear that a lot uh, from Microsoft system engineers, et cetera, when they're dealing with paths. 
And in this case, I used that terminology. So I said whack, whack, dot, whack, physical drive one. So just to go back and give you some of the terminology. Uh, so either way, you identify that namespace and, uh, it, and it runs, it gives you the information. Uh, now I, I do will say this, that there are different namespaces for different disks. So uh, sometimes you'll have to go and identify that. So if uh, you have MBR, this is the error you'll get. Another method of doing that is going back into disk management, just like we saw before, right clicking uh, the, the disk and then going to properties uh, and um, you'll be able to see the partition style, which is in this case, GPT. All right, so uh, we can also, uh, as we see here, the get-boot sector uh, that, that we see here with the path and physical drive one, um, we can see that drives boot sector, that first boot sector. This is actually important because uh, it will, number one, tell you how the disk is formatted, whether it's MPR or GPT, uh, partition, how it's partitioned, not formatted, how it's partitioned. And uh, we can then use uh, the get MBR or get GPT, and that gives us information on that boot sector. So here we see a more modern system, and we're running that get uh, dash boot sector uh, path physical uh, drive, physical disk, uh, physical drive, excuse me, and it gives us the information on it. And uh, then from there, we could do uh, get frenzy boot sector, uh, give it the path, and it gives me uh, some lower level information on the, uh, uh, the structure and the partition table. So uh, this is run against a disk formatted with MBR in this case, and this one's run against a disk formatted in GPT. Uh, further, in terms of the uh, grid partition table, uh, we can use that get dash partition table to, again, determine the type and of the boot sector, whether it's GPT or whether it's MBR, and get the correct uh, partition object. There's an entry point a, or a GUID partition table entry. Let's go ahead and zoom in on that uh, that we see right here. And so we're running a get frenzy partition table a dash path whack whack dot path whack physical drive zero in this case. And it even identifies the format which is NTFS, uh, whether it's bootable, uh, there are one, there's one that is bootable and two that aren't, and the size uh, in terms of start sector and end sector. And then uh, down here, uh, again in PowerShell, we're doing a get partition table. So we can actually see the entire partition table uh, of that physical drive one. And we see all uh, the partition GUIDs, the unique partition GUID, the starting LBA, the ending LBA, uh, the attributes, et cetera, the partition name. So uh, very, uh, very interesting stuff there. We can get some very low level information, how it's formatted, what the uh, partition entry object is, uh, and much more low level information. Uh, but also when we're looking at GPT headers and entries, we have operating systems that support it. A lot of them do, and they have to because of the size of disks these days. They're just so so much larger than they used to be, and so MBR just doesn't work anymore. So uh, we have a disk part, which is a very, a, a very important tool to get to learn, and you can run disk part from a command prompt in Windows and pull out all your volume information. Uh, as you see here, we're, we're moving through disk part. We start with disk part, and then the next disk part prompt we select uh, the first disk, disk zero, uh, and then uh, the next disk part prod, we go to detail uh, of the disk, and then it dumps out all the detail of that disk, including all the volumes, their labels, uh, their format, uh, whether they're healthy, whether they're bootable or not. And uh, so that would be disk part. Uh, in OS X, there's a disk utility, uh, and in Linux, there's a, uh, there are actually several different tools. And uh, one thing in, in Linux is there are usually uh, 10 different tools to do whatever you want. But one of the most popular one is called Gparted, uh, which stands for GNU Parted uh, tool. If we look over here on the right here, um, we're doing it. This is not Gparted in Linux. This is again, back to uh, Windows, but we've selected partition one 
and then we're doing the detail of a partition. So uh, again, we'll see this in the lab. It can follow me as I, as I show you uh, how to use uh, some of these low-level tools. But another one that we're going to spend time talking about at the end of this module is a sleuth kit. And uh, this can be used to look at detailed partitions also. Uh, also, you can use a hex editor. There are many different hex editor tools that you can use to go pull the low-level information and determine what's going on with this disk. So, uh, let's look at some artifacts that you might find as a forensic investigator in terms of uh, the GWIN partition table. Let's look at a case. Case one, uh, if the MBR is repartitioned or converted to GPT, then sector zero will generally be overwritten with a protective MBR. So if you want to recover the data from the previous MBR partition volume, you need uh, to use standard forensic methods uh, and you're going to be doing an extensive search for file systems. So yeah, uh, they, can, they can be deleted or overwritten, but there are methods, there are ways, we have ways of still pulling out information from those file systems. So that's case number one, that's if the MBR is repartitioned or converted to GPT. The next one, if the GPT is repartitioned or converted to MBR, uh, then the GPT header and all the tables might still be there intact. Uh, and then we have tools that we can use to find that. So we, uh, if you have an implementation of a general partition deletion tool on a GPT on a disk, might only delete the protective MBR. That's all that's deleted. And that can be recreated by reconstructing the disk. As I was saying, for the most part, uh, formatting uh, and even repartitioning uh, doesn't delete all of the data. And so we can use tools to find that. So as per UFI specification, if all of the fields in the partition entry are zeroed, so you have the partition uh, uh, area, that's not the entire disk, it's just a partition area, then it implies that the entry is not in use. In this case, data recovery from deleted GUID partition entries is not possible. So if you zero it out, then you can't go grab that info. So two different cases to, to look at. There are also GWID identifiers. So if you have a GPT scheme, um, it provides GWIDs that we can have. Uh, they have investigatory value because they're unique. They have potentially useful information in them. Uh, GWIDs have unique identified information both at the disk and individual partitions. And investigators use these uh, to decode GWIDs and UUIDs. So, and there can be hidden information on GPT disks. Uh, so an intruder, uh, we've seen, if, if you have a look at some of the uh, methods, uh, the, the illustrations of how tables are laid out and so on, there are, there are spaces that stuff can be hidden in. So you can actually hide data on GPT disks um, that you can't, uh, uh, that you can also do, by the way, on MBRs. And so the location of those GPD disks, or the data may be hidden, is where? Uh, Interpartition gaps, unpartitioned space towards the end of the disk, also in the GPT header, and lastly in reserved areas. So these are areas that are normally skipped over by the, uh, you, you don't see it when you look at the, the drive that's produced from that disk, but at a low level, if you have low level tools, you can load up and retrieve data hidden in these areas. And so as a forensic investigator, you'll need to have the tools to go dig that back out. And so we have current forensic methods and tools when we're dealing with uh, GPT analysis. They are often unsatisfactory to go into these low level GPT header, uh, reserved areas, on partition space, and interpartition gaps, and they require a higher level of tool uh, than the standard tools to go get that hidden information from a GPT disk. All right, so right before you, in your investigation, 
you have sitting on the desk a Mac. So how does the Mac boot process work? Well, first of all, we have several different things to, to look at. Uh, keep in mind, there's a, a legend here that describes uh, different types of files. So the blue ones we see here are EFI bin binary. So that's our UFI. Uh, the uh, sort of salmon colored ones here are the boot manager. Uh, and this nice little golden arrow is uh, a value add. And we see two different types of arrows here. We have API, uh, specified uh, communications. And then here, the blue lines are if there is an error. All right, so let's go ahead and see what we find. Uh, we have a standard firmware initialization. We have drivers and applications that are loaded. And then we have a boot from an ordered list of EFI OS loaders uh, executed. And then we have boot services are terminated. And then the operation is handed over to the OS loader. So this is the path that we're taking. Uh, after the firmware is initialized, then we have drivers uh, loaded. And we that's why we have uh, APIs that help with that in terms of the drivers and any app, low level applications uh, that help with communication between uh, the uh, Ring Zero uh, drivers and the hardware, right? And then from here, we move, move to uh, booting from uh, an ordered list of EFI OS loaders is executed, and that's called the boot code. So again, an EFI binary. And um, and then once that boot code is satisfactory, uh, then we hand over uh, to uh, the boot process to the OS. And once that happens, you'll see the screen switch over to the Apple logo and you'll begin booting that Mac OS X. But wait, there are other operating systems be besides uh, the Windows operating system and OS X for, for Macs. We also have probably the most popular operating system. If you take every single device from Android phones all the way through to uh, iOS devices and backend servers and data centers, and that is Linux. Um, if you look at the uh, table here, we see the kernel stage. So this is the lowest uh, uh, level of the operating system before we get to the uh, user level up in ring uh, one or two, depending on, on the OS. And then we have the bootloader stage, and then we have the lowest level here is a BIOS stage. So let's see what we have here. First, we have POST. What is POST? I hit the button on my Ubuntu Linux box because it's a cold boot, and then I get the power on self-test. Uh, which the BIOS uh, checks its hardware, says, do I have a CPU that works? Do I have RAM uh, memory in, in that works? Do I have, is, is my, are my buses up and running? Okay, good. All right, so now I'm going to search for an MBR. Um, or in the case of a UFI, because you can run Linux with uh, UFI computers, it's going to search for a GPT. Uh, and then it's going to uh, find the pointer to a bootloader, and you can have uh, several different bootloaders in Linux. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, either create a RAM disk and load uh, in NetRD, there's an image, uh, and then uh, the kernel is going to mount a virtual root. Uh, or we're going to just load the Linux kernel, uh, and then we're going to uh, mount the, uh, the real root, uh, file system, and then we're going to uh, run the init process, load that, and then run the system daemons. What are, what are daemons? Are they scary creatures running around a Linux box? Uh, no, what they actually are are uh, services that run in the background uh, uh, for, for Linux. So either way, once you run the virtual FS root down here, then you run uh, Linux RC, and uh, uh, then they, you prepare the file system, and then again, you're going to run the same thing. Eventually, once your uh, Linux uh, daemons are running, then it'll prepare the operating system according to how the user has set it up. Uh, in many cases, it will actually uh, load uh, a graphical environment like KDE or something like that to make it nice and good looking. But in other cases for uh, like servers and other devices, uh, it'll just load the kernel 
and run the processes that were set up for whatever device you're dealing with. So that's the Linux boot process in a nutshell. Uh, as you can see, we focus mainly on the Windows boot process. And this is because if you're dealing with desktops or you're dealing with laptops, that's going to be the process you're likely going to be dealing with. And when you're dealing with uh, servers in the dev, uh, you know, servers or um, computers in, that are being programmed for Linux app, apps in the dev department, the programming department, or if you're dealing with OS X uh, and for Macs, maybe dealing with, uh, again, the dev department or creative people, uh, then you'll hit that OS X. So that now brings us to understanding file systems. So we're going to look at file systems of Linux, Mac uh, operating systems. So let's have a look. So Windows file systems. Uh, back in the old days of Microsoft Windows, the only file system available uh, was a FAT or the file allocation table. And you don't see this used very much in its uh, just regular FAT uh, uh, old school DOS uh, format anymore. And what we're talking about now is when you're dealing with a Windows file system or a Linux file system, you can choose uh, among multiple file systems that you will use to format the disk drive. And we've already talked about FAT a little bit, it comes in 12, 16, 32, or XFAT. And uh, depending on the size entries of the file structure, uh, FAT12, uh, that's really old school, uh, in terms of the bytes per cluster within the allocation table is 1.5. Uh, and you only have less than 4,087 clusters with 12. With 16, it's between uh, 4,087 and 65,526 clusters. Uh, and then in FAT32, you have four bytes per cluster. And it's between 65,526 and uh, some 268 million clusters. And so that's what we're talking about with these tables. If we zoom in a little bit on what we see here, we have uh, uh, the fat structure itself on the far right. Uh, in the middle, we have clusters. And in the far left, we have directory structures. And one of the problems between, uh, not between, but one of the problems that we had with FAT is even though you have a file, see on the far left side you have file1.dat, um, you may have still a huge number of bytes because it's not a large file, it's a small file. You waste all that, sec that, that section, that's, that part of the structure, you waste it all uh, going from cluster uh, 33 to 34. And so um, with the file allocation table, even though as drives, as disks got bigger and drives got bigger, um, you still had a problem with file storage because not all the space was able to be used because of the fat structure. So um, Microsoft went from fat uh, to fat32. Um,